saying the 70s was extremely violent years for the mob is an understatement. While researching that particular time period, I came across certain information that I remembered reading about somewhere else. And that was in the excellent book, Hitman, by Scott Dishy. To be more specific, it was in a chapter titled 22 Caliber Killers. During a two-year period in the 70s, a series of hits, at least 20, were committed with 22 caliber weapons. The victims consisted of FBI informers and potential witnesses. The 22 caliber is a bullet that, when fired into a body, bounces around and causes more damage. For some, the most appealing feature is its ability to be silenced. Also back in the 70s, one could purchase a hit kit, which consisted of a carrying case and a 22 automatic modified with a silencer. 22s are mostly used for target practice or hunting small animals, but it also was the preferred weapon for carrying out hits. Investigators focused their attention on the Purple Gang out of East Harlem for the 22 caliber hits. This came after some members were caught purchasing 22 caliber weapons in Florida, specifically in Oakland Park and Pompano Beach. The Purple Gang consisted of a group of guys out of East Harlem, some of who were related to Wise Guys. They were led by the Melnich brothers, Joey and Michael. Their affiliations included both the Lucchese and Bonanno families. However, they developed their closest ties to the Genovese family's 116th Street crew. Initially, the gang was committing robberies and assaults, but those crimes soon elevated into narcotics and murder. Outsourced by the mob, they began carrying out mob-related hits involving a 22 caliber, a weapon recognized on the street as the Purple Gang's calling card. During the 1970s, neighborhood junk dealers became the targets of kidnappers, and it was the Purple Gang that they looked to for protection, because not even kidnapping crews wanted to tangle with the Purples. Let's quickly review a few of the 22 caliber murders. As I mentioned, there were about 20. On July 1st, 1976, Vincent Capone was killed in Hoboken, New Jersey, after 15 rounds from a 22 was fired into his car. Capone was believed to be a Genovese associate and was accused of skimming by the Genovese family, and he was also believed to be an informant. On January 20th, 1977, a wiretapping expert and the owner of an electronics store, Frank Bok Chung Chin, was discovered next to his Mercedes on West 69th Street in Manhattan. Chin sold equipment to members of the mob and wind up becoming an FBI informant, and his status as an informant leaked out. The following murder placed the Purple Gang further under law enforcement's microscope. On February 8, 1977, Arthur Milgram was shot several times in the head with a 22 caliber in the parking lot of his Belrose, Queens building. Milgram was one of New York's biggest lottery ticket vendors. He also was into the Genovese loan sharks in a big way. Apparently, Milgram received $350,000 from a Florida-based company with ties to the Purple Gang and the Genovese family. On March 25, 1977, Thomas Palermo was discovered hogtied and shot multiple times in the trunk of a car at John F. Kennedy Airport. He was shot with a 22 and a 38. Palermo, a career criminal and jewel thief, began cooperating with prosecutors and supplying information about drug deals involving Purple Gang members. On April 10, 1977, Genovese member John Coca-Cola Laudiri was on a prison furlough and had just registered himself at the Red Bull Inn in Bridgewater, New Jersey. While moving his car closer to his room, a shooter, armed with a 22, equipped with a silencer, approached him to shoot him, but the gun jammed. According to future testimony, Ladiri told him, What are you going to do now, tough guy? The shooter then pulled out a backup 38 and shot Ladiri to death. Police later found the ejected 22s and the 22 weapon itself, which they not only traced to the weapons purchased in Florida by the Purple Gang, but the ballistics were similar to the weapon used in the Capone, Chin, Milgram, and Palermo hits. Apparently, Ladiri's sin was verbally abusing fellow wise guys while in prison. On April 27, 1977, Carmine Zaccardi, former acting boss of the Genovese family, disappeared. His family received a ransom demand of 100000 money that was allegedly paid with the help of Fat Tony Salerno. Nonetheless, Zaccardi was never seen again. Blame fell on the Westies leader, Mickey Spillane, and he was eventually killed that same year. But according to an informant, it was the Purple Gang who was responsible for kidnapping and killing Zaccardi. 
Gino Galina was a former assistant district attorney in Manhattan, and as many former DAs, he switched sides and became a criminal defense lawyer, one who represented numerous members of the mob and those associated to it. Galina's fees were up there for the 1970s by charging over 100000 but his clientele could afford his steep fees. Some of his clients included Vincent Papa, a Lucchese associate and major narcotics dealer who was involved with the drugs from the French Connection that disappeared from a police evidence room. Papa was murdered in prison in July 1977. Dominique Wassini, a Frenchman and international narcotics dealer, was also killed in prison in 1978. Both Papa and Wassini were serving time in Atlanta Federal Prison, and both negotiated with the FBI in Galena's presence. They offered to provide information in exchange for reduced sentences. He also defended the following. Genovese family member John DiGilio, Purple Gang members Frank Viserto Jr., Arthur Fiore, and Purple Gang associate Alphonse Funzi Siska, who would become a Gambino captain. He also defended the future Gambino acting boss, Arnold Squatiri, and represented him on a murder case and was able to plead him out to a less account of manslaughter. He also defended Johnny Fatface Petroselli, a Lucchese associate who once hid Gus Faraci after he killed the DEA agent in 1989. Petroselli would be killed himself by the Lucchese family for refusing to give Faraci up who they wanted to kill. In 1973, Petroselli was on trial for double homicide, and Galena testified on his behalf regarding a meeting he tape recorded with a prosecution witness who admitted to lying. Galena represented Donald Francos, who faced a murder charge for killing Lucchese associate Richard Bellello in Clinton Correction Facility in October 1974. He also represented Frank Matthews, one of the biggest drug traffickers and kingpins in America. Following Matthews' arrest in Las Vegas on June 6, 1973, for tax evasion and conspiracy to distribute heroin and cocaine, Matthews' bail was set at $5 million. Nonetheless, Galena had it reduced, and he was released on 350000 Once free on bail, Matthews took his girlfriend and millions of dollars and became a fugitive. He was paying Galena a large amount of money to still represent him, but became enraged when Galena suggested he give himself up and plead guilty. Matthews was never seen again and still remains wanted to this day. Another person of interest that Galena represented was Frank Lucas, the Harlem drug kingpin depicted in the movie American Gangster. Lucas used Galena to fix a case and paid him $400,000 to do so. At some point, while Lucas was on Rankers Island, $200,000 went missing from a safety deposit box. While on a visit, Galena gave Lucas the bad news. But since Galena had the key to the box, Lucas blamed him and jumped over the table and began beating him. He had to be pulled off by the guards, and I'll get to what he said to Galena in a minute. A fellow attorney who knew Galena said the following. His clients were among some of the most vicious and brutal people imaginable. On the night of November 3rd, 1977, Gino Galena went out to dinner with his young secretary. And sometime after 10 p.m., he pulled his 1975 gray Cadillac near Varick and Carmine Street in Manhattan's Greenwich Village. While Galena and the secretary were getting out of the car, a shooter walked up and fired 10 times. Galena was hit by seven of those bullets in the head, neck, chest, and stomach. The secretary was also hit by a ricocheting bullet. A light-colored Cadillac pulled up and the shooter jumped in and the car sped away. Galena was rushed to St. Vincent's Hospital, but died 90 minutes later. His secretary was treated and released. The bullets that killed Galena were not 22s, they were 38s. On the night he was killed, Galena had a gun on him that he never had the chance to pull out. In addition to the weapon, he also had a recording device that was found on the ground at the crime scene. Galena had been cooperating with the FBI and the U.S. Attorney's offices in New Jersey, Manhattan, and Brooklyn. In fact, on the day he was killed, he met with the U.S. attorney at First Andrews Plaza in Manhattan. He also appeared as a key witness before a Newark, New Jersey grand jury and specifically testified about the 22 caliber hitters who was identified as Chin Gigante, John DiGilio, Salvatore Braguglio, and Tommy Principe. Galena also explained how the Genovese family laundered money from their various rackets by purchasing real estate in upstate New York. What's more interesting is that he told the FBI that he could identify Jimmy Hoffa's killers and said he taped the people responsible talking about where they buried Hoffa's body. 
Following his murder, the FBI searched for that tape in a safety deposit box belonging to Galena, but it was empty. There's a wide range of theories regarding Galena's murder. Let's go over them. Martin Light, a former prosecutor turned defense lawyer who also represented members of the mob, testified before the President's Commission on Organized Crime. According to Light, for years he was on Carmine Persico's payroll and mostly handled legal issues for Greg Scarpa. He said Scarpa would have sit-downs at his club, the Wimpy Boys, and on one occasion, Light was called in during a sit-down to give his side of his story. Scarpa then took the person he was sitting down with for a walk to the corner. Light heard gunshots, and only Scarpa came walking back. One of the other things he testified about was Gino Galena. He said Galena was killed because he was suspected of being an informant and for keeping money that belonged to a client, which could possibly be Frank Lucas. That day in Rankers Island, when Lucas attacked Galena, he also threatened him that if he didn't get his money back in 24 hours, he was a dead man. In 1980, an informant named William Jackson testified that Lucas gave the order to kill Galena, but that claim lacked the evidence needed to back it up. Another report claimed that Galena was close to members of the Purple Gang and even helped them set up kidnappings. At the time he began cooperating, Galena provided information on Frank Viserto Jr. and Joseph Sosi, both Purple Gang members. Years later, Viserto allegedly claimed responsibility for the murders of Carmine Zaccardi and Gino Galena. Let me quickly mention the super thanks icon found beneath this video in the three dot drop down for anyone who liked to show support for videos like this. It's law enforcement's belief that Galena's murder was the result of a leak from the New Jersey grand jury. In regard to most of the 22 caliber victims, there were leaks as well of secret government files and sealed court records. It's not far-fetched to say, obviously, the Purple Gang or the mob itself had sources, people on their payroll, who fed them classified information regarding investigations and informants. Gino Galena's murder still remains on South.